We'll begin with Fred. There we go. Got it. Thank you, Dan, and thank you, uh, all you Tea Party folks, for inviting us here to this forum. This is going to be a, a happening, and uh, I'm looking forward to what's going to transpire. Uh, I, it's on. I just uh, apparently I don't have it close, to, close enough to my mouth. Uh, anyway, my name is Fred Rhinus, and uh, I'm from Bernie, and. Uh, I'm running for supervisor because I think it's uh, time from somebody from Eastern Shasta County uh, was on the board. It's been a long time since we've had somebody, and we've had things that uh, been imposed upon us the last few years, and uh, it's, I think it's real critical that we have somebody representing our end of the, the county. I'm going to forego, forego my uh, pedigree and my history and all that good stuff because I want to save some time, and you'll get all that. Uh, it's all in my brochure in the back. Uh, please grab one. Thank you. Well, I'm Patrick Henry Jones. Thank you again for having me. This is uh, not the first time I've been here. I did want to thank the Reading Tea Party Patriots. This has become the place for debate here in Shasta County, and so I appreciate the opportunity to come for you, come before you today. I grew up here in Shasta County. I've worked at Jones's Fort for over 30 years and as a small businessman. I got involved in politics in 2002. I ran for council then and I lost. I ran in 2004 and lost. I won in 2006 and then I also was re-elected in 2010. We had some very difficult issues over that course of time and it takes uh, a strong commitment to do what's right under great pressure. We have some great issues coming up here in Shasta County, specifically in eastern Shasta County, and we need someone with proven leadership. I think I have demonstrated that. I think I'm up for the challenge, and I would appreciate everyone right now who here has a checkbook that has money in it. There's three people. My name is Patrick Jones. I appreciate you all being here tonight. Thank you. Gosh, I'd love to know what the end of that was. So. Hi, I'm Pam Giacomini. Thank you very much for having me. Um, I'm an, a small business owner from Hat Creek, uh, fourth generation. Um, Shasta County is a wonderful combination of natural resources, dynamic communities, and incredible people. I'm a fourth generation resident of District 3. My husband, Henry, and I operate a cattle ranch and sell natural grass-finished beef, and my husband made it tonight. Hey. Um, we work each day to ensure that future generations can continue to live and work here in Shasta County. I grew up working alongside of my dad, doing everything from being on horseback, driving a tractor, doing accounting. All of that taught me wonderful things and an incredible work ethic. That upbringing allowed me to move on to Sacramento, where I worked in the state legislature as well as doing regulatory work, and my, my clock is ticking. Um, and so that took me on to do greater challenges so I can very well represent you. I have the experience on both the state uh, legislative and local levels to get things done. Go to pamjackamini.com. Thanks. And before we move forward, um, about after every two questions, I will let you know what your float time is. Okay, so we'll begin with question number one with Fred Rhinus. This, this uh, question is for Patrick. Uh, Patrick, I, uh, are you familiar with the uh, CFLR project uh, that uh, is proposed for the area of Bernie? Um, if you are, can you uh, let me know what you, uh, what you think of it? Well, it's a, it's a collaborative, and uh, there are many issues up on the Hill. This particular issue that he's talking about, the Bernie Hat Creek Basin Project, uh, I don't have a great amount of, inch, uh, of information on it, and uh, there are many other issues that are on the Hill that I am a little bit poor on. Uh, but I take the time. Uh, when I am elected, uh, I work hard. I do my staff reports. Uh, I've made every council meeting here in Reading, and, and I will work very much to represent the people in the district, and that is important. I think that's what's been lacking uh, in this district, a person that has been attentive to the needs. And for every issue, there are multiple sides to every issue, and they need to be looked at, 
and, uh, and I will do that. I will do my homework. I will ask the tough questions, and then I'll represent the people on the board. The fight is ultimately here in Reading. That is where the work gets done. I'm very familiar with the work here in the county and, and in the city, and that ultimately is where the fight will be, and I'm up for that challenge. No rebuttal. My question uh, is to Pam. Uh, Pam, a few weeks ago we had an informal water meeting and uh, Les Baugh was there, our, our uh, supervisor for District 5 was there and you were there. You seemed to indicate that uh, you agreed with a six county memorandum of understanding and in that memorandum of understanding um, it was related to water resources and essentially said that related to water resources do not recognize jurisdictional boundaries and therefore require regional solutions. Now I have a big problem with that and I wanted to know what your response to the six county memorandum of understanding. Great Patrick, I appreciate that question and that is actually related to the integrated regional watershed management planning process that's going on. Um, and I think Shasta County needs to be fully involved in it. And Gary's out there shaking his head no. The only way that you can get something done and make sure that the words on paper are correct is to be involved in the process. And it's highly important that Shasta County is involved in that. Eric Wiedemeyer from uh, county staff, the Shasta County Water Agency, as well as Leonard Modi sitting on the current uh, supervisor's board um, are involved in that process. And it's very, very important. Why it's such a large region, all I can say is they must have decided that it's like ground water uh, like area because we are actually involved in an upper Pitt River watershed planning process which is again like area it's not six counties but again if that's the region that they chose to draw the lines around Shasta County absolutely needs to be involved in that and the only way they can actually make sure that they protect our rights is to be involved and, and uh, choose to make sure that the words on paper are correct I'd like to rebut with that. The, uh, the six county, it started off as a four county memorandum of understanding. It's now six counties and all these counties are counties to the south of us. And when we make agreements, these are memorandum of understandings with key features in place. Um, and you believe in regional solutions, what ultimately is going to end up happening is they want our water. I mean, that's the bottom line. We have a natural resource and they want it and so they enter into a memorandum of understanding to ultimately reduce our usage and increase their usage. I think they're highly dangerous. The, the vast majority of the public do not realize that these are going on and occurring right now. The biggest issues that are going to face Shasta County in the next few years are water without question. And I think these memorandums understanding, I think this is where me and Pam draw the line, is that she wants to sit down and make memorandums understanding. And I say for Eastern Shasta County, let's protect our water. Let's not give up that fight. I got my two cents too, right? Okay. Uh, yeah, I'm actually with Pam. Uh, we can't put our head in the sand and uh, not uh, be part of the program. Uh, we'll lose the fight. Uh, bottom line is one of the things that's real critical is that uh, we need to think about developing uh, new water storage. Uh, I recently watched a, a, the government channel and they had a feature there where uh, talking about uh, the Delta and all of Central Valley Water Project and the whole nine yards there. And, uh, and I thought for some time, I wonder if, it's, uh, if we actually could make more storage and solve our problem. Sure enough, there was a fellow that stood up that had, the, had, the, had all the numbers. I don't have all those numbers with me. But he, he described the fact that we have a lot of water going over in various weirs. We got plenty of water going over uh, in the wintertime. We need to store that water. Uh, ultimately, the state owns the water, so when it comes push to comes to shove, that can happen. They, they can take it, but uh, we need to be a, a part of the process so that we don't, uh, you know, we don't lose that.
Thank you. So we're going to get right back into integrated regional watershed management planning process. So it is an opportunity to actually bring dollars into our community to help people solve long-term issues and to do projects that are very costly to local towns and to individual landowners. And so this is a process that is highly important. So uh, this question, I'm going to actually ask both candidates. So can I do them? Who do I do first? Only can ask one. Only one, okay. And if next go around, if you want to ask it again, that's okay. Okay, perfect, got it. Okay, so Patrick, I'll ask you that first. Well, it's very important when you're taking in grant money to do these or you're going to solicit funds, because both of that has been going on, and we've certainly seen a lot of it down here in the Valley, that you're going to make agreements uh, based on those funds coming in. And, and certainly, uh, there are grants that could be used appropriately, but this is a very dangerous area. As you know, it's very easy to accept that money. And as you accept that money, then you have responsibilities, and we often put ourselves in a weaker position for taking that money than if we would refuse that money. And I know it's difficult for politicians to refuse money. I see it all the time in the city of Reading and in the county. They want to accept those grants, but there's strings attached. And ultimately, when you read the detail and the fine print of those strings, you'll find that it puts us many times in a weak position. I'm not saying all forms of, of regional water quality control grant money are, are evil and demonized, but when you look at them, you will find that many of them puts us in a very bad situation. I'm very worried about, about going down a path that you can't return from. Well, I agree, and that's exactly why I'm involved in the process. I actually own water rights. They are critical to my family's operation and for us to be able to stay in business over the long term. I'm going to be involved in the process so I can make sure that the words are right on paper and that we'll be able to bring those funds into the community to help the town of Bernie do some leak detection, which would be something that would cost the taxpayers, the ratepayers there in that town, an extreme amount of money. If we're able to bring those grant dollars in after making sure that in the planning process that the words on paper are correct, then that's going to help those ratepayers take care of something that's a deferred maintenance for years on end that they wouldn't be able to afford as ratepayers. So it's something very beneficial and we need to look at how we can bring these dollars in and make sure the words on paper are correct and that we are protecting our water rights. My question? Uh, Patrick, uh, what do you think of uh, the plan by the sheriff to, the, to use uh, that million dollar plus uh, windmill fund f f for the new jail? Well, the, uh, the, the, the county ultimately decided to use the million dollars for a library, correct? Pardon? No, not yet. Actually, they funded a $40,000 um, study uh, to right. see about... Well, right now, um, you know, with realignment, we have a serious issue here in Shasta County with, with criminals returning uh, to Shasta County, uh, having nowhere to put them. And the real big picture is, is not building so much a new jail, but being able to man the one that we have and having a viable revenue stream uh, to be able to operate it correctly, which we have not been able to do. Everyone knows we're in the fifth year of a global recession. We've certainly seen it here, and revenue just simply is not coming in. And, and so there's been talk about of a new jail. There's been talk about, uh, you know, a certain amount of money being available and then we'll have to come up with a, a fund or a matching, not a 50% match, but a lesser a match. Uh, and, and the real question is going to be um, not building a new facility, but manning it and over the long haul. And we simply have shown that with the revenue coming in, that some different choices may need to be made and some tough decisions may have to, have to come before long. Yeah, first of all, I don't, you know, it's that million bucks was for us, Bernie. We got, we got the windmills, we should have got the million bucks. That's one, one of the issues. But the other issue for me is that I don't think we need the jail. Uh, personally, I want to see, see us try to, to rehab uh, these low-level felons. Um, I know that you don't think that's a, <laughs> I heard the groans, but I'm working with a couple of them right now, and uh, they are salvageable. And uh, we can keep building jails until we're blue in the face. Uh, we'll just have more jails, you know. Bottom line is we need to put these people to work. Uh, we need to, we can take them out. Uh, part of this CFLR project that I just 
shared with uh, Patrick and Bernie. Uh, one of the things they want to do is uh, to do all this work around Bernie, and then they want to uh, run fires through out underneath the forest. They want to burn the burn the uh, wilderness area, and uh, you can do some other things. You can take crews in there and, and thin that area out in those areas that are off the roads. And uh, we need to need to take those guys and put them to work. Uh, this question is for Pam. Pam, uh, tank, would you support the tank movement or not? And can you explain a little bit about it? Absolutely, Patrick. Um, tank, as most of you probably know, was a movement to do uh, another round of high speed power lines, you know, high capacity power lines through a lot of our rural communities. And in my opinion, it involved pretty much a taking of private property and was being shoved down folks' throats. So no, I would not support it. A, a short rebut. Uh, Tank is a transmission agency of Northern California, and essentially it was going to bring power from Northern California up in Modoc County all the way through, through Cottonwood, to supply power to Southern, Central and Southern California. The city of Redding was a member of that, uh, but I stood up, I worked with the people from Montgomery Creek and Round Mountain, they have a, a substation there to help defeat that process. And uh, I tell you, without the folks from Montgomery Creek and Round Mountain, uh, that project probably would have been moving forward. Okay, so Dan, I wanna clarify. We have seven questions, I have seven questions for each of the other candidates, or seven questions total? No, each, each candidate will ask seven questions to whoever period. they want, period. Uh, okay, I was confused, sorry. That's okay, that's okay. okay. Thanks. Um, okay, so let me see what I would like to ask Fred. Um, Fred, okay. So as I traverse the district and speak with citizens, um, they're very frustrated by the planning and building process in the county and the restrictions that they run up against in trying to get a project done. Um, how will you make a difference in our planning and building departments? Yeah, that's a fact. We all know that. Uh, I uh, built. I had. Uh, I bought the lodge there in uh, pit, pit one from PG&E, and when I did, I came down to Reading to go to the planning department to see if uh, I could put a restaurant in. Uh, their st their pat answer is no. Yeah, it wasn't until I got Haas involved and he came up and took a look at it, and, uh, and we got got the planning department to take the whole thing and present it to the, to the supervisors. We need a whole lot more friendly uh, county offices situation, and you all know that, and we all, all three of us know that. And it's, it's, and, and that's what we need to do, and that's what's gonna happen if, if everything I can do to make it happen anyway. Great answer, Fred, and I share your pain. Um, we need to ensure that we provide a service to our citizens. Um, we need to be able to help them navigate the process. When somebody comes in with a project, um, we need to be able to sit down with them and say, okay, this is the size of the universe. This is what you're going to have to comply with in order to get your project completed. So we need to assist them in helping them to comply with the laws and get their project completed. Before we move forward, we'll give your float time. Your remaining float time. Mr. Rhinus, you have four minutes, 30 seconds. Patrick, you have three minutes, 45 seconds. And Pam, you have four minutes. My turn, Pam. What is your uh, position on the Hatchet Ridge Windmill Expansion Project? Um, Fred, I don't know of an expansion project at this point. Um, I know that there are three uh, meteorological towers up there currently looking at other potential windmill projects. And the way that I approach projects like this is I want to read the EIR. I want to see what's in there. I want to be able to ask the tough questions and then get input from citizens of how it's going to affect them and then make a decision. Okay, I can only ask you one question, so I, but... Uh, 
I thought perhaps you might, yeah, they, I know that they've done some preliminary work because I have a house in Bernie and uh, we've had the bird people stay at our house. It's a rental and they come in and that's one of the preliminary studies they do is look at the migratory birds flying over the, over the ridge and we had that on the first project. So there's, there is another project in the works if they can get it going and uh, the first project in my opinion uh, initially, I was on the fence. I wasn't sure if it was a good project. It was, uh, it was indifferent. I was concerned about possibly the weather changing a little bit because I knew the eddy when it came across the ridge as an action like this. And I didn't know if that pulled the moisture down and then it went down because the winds are going like, windmills are going like this, so the clouds keep on trucking. I didn't know. I still don't know. And they don't know. And, they, and that was a question I asked and they couldn't answer. But since then, I've got an opinion. And the opinion is that uh, uh, this, that windmill project is a... Uh, is not a good thing. We're going to end up with some dead windmills up there in about 10 years when the PG, when PG&E PG &E doesn't have to. Uh, I can keep going, right? Until I run out of my town. Okay. <laughs> when when uh, when PG&E doesn't have to buy that power, uh, they won't because it costs uh, costs about 20 some cents to operate those windmills as opposed to running uh, hydro at five. And so right now they're having to shut down uh, 150 meg plant so that they can take the power from the windmills uh, that only generate 100, I think it's 110 meg, but there's only so much room on the grid. So you're shutting down a, a power plant, hydro, that much more efficient, so we can take that. That's, uh, that was stimulus money, that was quick fix for the county, but it's a loser for all of us down the road. And, uh, this question is for Pam. Pam, uh, with regards to a tax sharing agreement between the cities and the county, you say you have solutions for Shasta County. What is your thought on a tax sharing agreement and what is your solution? Great. Thanks, Patrick. Um, I think we ought to work very hard to make sure that we get a revenue sharing agreement between the cities and the county. I think that's a critical issue. Um, I think it was, you know, it's been talked about and debated for decades now and it really needs to occur. That would allow us to make sure that we had development occur in the appropriate locations and everybody would benefit in the county and the cities. And I think it's really a critical issue and I think that, you know, well-minded people can sit down and get an agreement worked out that will benefit everybody in the county. I'll re have a response. Um, everybody talks about a tax sharing agreement and certainly when the county is in a lesser position then they talk about it when the city is in a lesser position they talk about it but really nobody has a plan I have a plan and I've been talking about it for about the last year and it's in the Oasis Road specific area where we have no infrastructure you start where there is no winners or losers and that will control your regional sprawl in addition everyone has to pay in order to generate revenue. So if you're going to do the infrastructure up to a 40% percentage, then you can get the tax re increment of 40%. Or if you do 60%, then you receive 60% in an area where there is no infrastructure. That is truly an agreement where the city and the county could come together and create a, on an equal footing so that neither the residents of the county or the residents of the city are exposed to something that's unnecessary for them. It would be inappropriate to do a tax sharing agreement citywide. The, the residents of the city would be the big losers. In a specific area where there is no infrastructure, that is a, a place where it could happen. I have a plan that makes sense, that controls urban sprawl, that helps the county if they're willing to do their part and take part in the infrastructure necessary to have the development that is appropriate for that area. I keep getting confused. I happen to be a ha uh, founding member of the Bernie Hat Creek Community Forest and Watershed Group. Uh, this group, if you haven't heard of it, this is actually for Patrick, um, if you haven't heard of it, has worked to implement an all lands management strategy. Um, have, have you, uh, Patrick, been involved in a process such as this? No. Um, well, I have, and it's actually the group that brought the CLFR money to our area in order to be able to do work on the Whittington Forest and as well as in Burden Gardens. This is going to create a whole bunch of great work to do fuels hazard reduction in our forests up around the Bernie Hat Creek area. And we are going to be able to put a lot of people to work. 
Um, we need to try to get the Covanta plant back up online um, because that's going to need to take a lot of that product. So we've got the Bernie Gardens project, which is actually a cooperative um, agreement. We've got our very first timber harvest plan, and Fred will love this because he's a forester, uh, timber harvest plan done with four landowners. So four landowners were able to go together and do one timber harvest plan. So this is an example of streamlining regulations and getting things done on the ground and finding solutions. It was a really cool project and it's so exciting and that's what brought the CLFR money to us. Uh, the Whittington project is actually going to be on completely four service grounds, which is going to take all of that, you know, really tough forest ground that doesn't have a lot of merchantable timber, be able to clean that fuels up and be able to get that to be a, a healthy, restored forest and be operating. And NEPA is almost complete on that. They hope to be act actually hope to be able to operate on that project next year. So again, you know, we need to tr we're bringing those jobs to the county and uh, by these cooperative groups where we do these innovative projects and find solutions, that's how we're helping to bring jobs back to the county. Yeah, Bernie, Bernie's dying. Uh, we've, our schools are 30% less than when I was teaching there in 90, 91. Uh, this project she's involved in, she's involved in this CFLR project, and uh, it's supposed to generate 200 jobs uh, for Bernie. Uh, this hydro, there's a cogen plant that she talks about that's down, needs to come online. I wrote a letter uh, two weeks ago to pg and &E and gave them a suggestion that they might try to run that, that plant at... Uh, uh, some sometime at, uh, with the natural gas, and it's not cost effective, and that's why they shut it down with just uh, biomass. But we got to have it. You, they only have one plant really you can take the material into right now in Bernie, and so this project is, out, in my opinion, is out of the water as far as you know. They're still going to do it. I just talked to a fellow that works for the Forest Service this week, and he's involved right in the middle of it. They're going to do six hundred thousand dollars worth of work uh, this summer. But it's uh, kind of an all-encompassing project. We really need that thinning work done. Uh, and we need those jobs in Bernie real bad. We're 20% unemployed in Bernie uh, all the time. Okay, this one's for Pam. Uh, while you uh, have been on the State Board of Forestry, has there been any discussion concerning the disappearance of the porcupine in our forests? That's a great one. Um, yes, uh, I did serve on the State Board of Forestry for six years. Um, I was uh, appointed by Governor Schwarzenegger. Um, and it was an excellent experience uh, to be able to serve the people of the state of California and try to help our forestry industry um, get some things accomplished on the ground. We were able to actually get a couple of good things accomplished while I was there, which felt great. And no, I have not heard a thing about the porcupine becoming less. I'm sorry. That doesn't surprise me. Uh, <clears throat> I wrote an article seven years ago, and it was published in Record Searchlight, and I pointed out at that time that the porcupine is gone in eastern Chasta County. At that time, I was running a crew of about a dozen guys throughout the forest, and we look up every tree, to, deciding whether we mark it or not mark it. So we literally covered all the trees in the forest. That's where the porcupines hang out, in the trees. And uh, there wasn't any. And so it was interesting, that the feedback I got, and. Uh, now we're seven years later from the time I wrote that article, and I wrote another article to the record searchlight. They haven't published it yet, and they probably won't because they think I'm a kook. But I got, I got two copies. Of the, they got both those back in the back, and I also have some porcupine balls, and I want you to take one because I want you to remember this story. The porcupine is gone, and he's been gone, and it's, and it's really interesting because we got all this talk about the spotted owl, you know, and it's a bunch of hooey manui. And uh, the porcupine's really gone, really is. And he's not just gone on the east, east side, he's gone over here and he's gone in the west, too. It's the west side too. Very few of them left. I called a fishing game two weeks ago. You want to talk to two wildlife biologists? I did. One of them told me he had 300 uh, cameras out in the woods for three years, hasn't seen one crosses. Why is it that the porcupine can disappear? We can do all this stuff with a spotted owl. And the world didn't end when the porcupine disappeared. You know what? It won't end when the spotted owl disappeared. 
because we still got places. We got all kinds of places, wilderness areas, set-aside areas. Those critters are in there. Those are banks. We can pull them in, pull them, put them back. Uh, we don't have to worry about losing these critters like we think we are, you know. We need to worry about the people and how about the jobs because they're, they're losing jobs every year with this, with this spotted owl thing, and it's a farce, an absolute farce. Can I respond? Okay, great. I love that, Fred. That's great. Um, I just wish um, that I'd have known that there weren't any porcupines left when I had to take a trailer load of dogs to the vet one day and have, you know, we were there all over the vet's floor pulling porcupine quills out of my dogs. So there's a few, there's a few around still. Uh, this question is for Pam, and it concerns the Hawkins Project at Knighton Road. First, do you support it or uh, object to it? And after seeing the traffic model uh, from the, the development itself showing traffic backing up onto I-5, um, does that further help your decision in approving it or, or not approving it? Thanks, Fred. Patrick, the uh, Knighton Road project is one project that I really have mixed emotions on. Um, I have looked at the traffic model, and it is very concerning to me, and I guess that is probably why Caltrans and the county are having a little issue right now. Um, on one hand, there's an interchange there on I-5. Um, it's been there for decades, and that probably started this whole debate. This is one of the few areas in the county that actually has property that could be developed which would bring jobs to the county. Now is it appropriate? Is it going to be done right? I can't answer that. Um, we do need tax revenue and we do need jobs in the county. But I also am a lover of prime soil. I wish I could pick up that prime soil and take it to Hat Creek where we would put it to very good use, I tell you. We need it. We don't have much prime soil in Hat Creek. So um, this is a very difficult project. Um, I'm going to really look forward to see how the voters vote on this project. Rebut. Well, first, Caltrans is suing the county. They're not just horsing around. They're suing them because you can't have traffic backing up on I-5. And it happens every day at peak demand. And it's simply unacceptable that the county push this project forward uh, when they could clearly see that their own traffic model, that Hawkins Development owns their own traffic model, shows traffic backing up. That would be one thing if the traffic model didn't show traffic backing up. That would be at least something, but, but it shows it clearly. Now, I'm all for private property rights, and I think if you own property, you have a right to develop that property. But you also have to be responsible and mitigate for your traffic needs. And in this area, there are, there are very little improvements that have been done since 1965 when the overpass was put in. And it's up to the developer, it's his responsibility to make sure that those, all those improvements are done. And you're talking 10, 20 million dollars of improvements. We had to do the same thing at Oasis Road. We had to, to assess all those properties and create, create a plan and assess those properties in order to address the traffic impact needs. At Hawkins, they have simply failed to do that. And the county, so hungry and so, so much needed revenue, overlooked the basic principles of safety and allowed this project to move forward. It's really unexcusable, and Caltrans cannot let it go. They must sue the county over this. And of course, the residents are very upset. And someday, someday, I hope politicians start listening to the voters and start doing the will of the people. I think the people in that area have spoken very loud and clear what they'd like to see there. And, and I think come June 5th, we're gonna see what happens there. As a city council member, it's important for me to retain some of my businesses here in the city of Reading. And we've had to, to work hard on that. And we have tried to change the culture at City Hall and we've been making strides. Once upon a time, the city was less, less friendly than what the county is and we're seeing that shift today because we've worked hard to try to change the county and we're certainly not done. Bureaucrats get in like ticks and they're hard, hard to change that culture. But over time you can do it and you have to be persistent and you have to, I, I hate to use the word patience because we're out of patience. We have very little time to waste. Uh, in, in a fifth year of a global recession we do need to put people to work. But there's a right way to do it and the Hawkins development is the wrong way to do it. So, Patrick, you keep uh, referring to the OASIS project, which I know has been a, a project that's very near and dear to your heart. So, are there government funds, or will there be government funds that will go into um, completing that project? Yes, we've used government funds. We've used, 
And not too long ago, about two years ago, uh, the current administration wanted us to use AARA money. Those are your rein reinvestment and recovery funds. And so we used that money, which was about $2.2 .2 million, to do the loop on ramp at Oasis Road to put people to work. And we quickly got some much needed construction jobs going. In doing so, Caltrans then saw that we made effort on a 65 year old or a, about a 50 year old. Uh, overpass and they allowed us with permits in hand to build 400,000 square feet at Oasis Road and today the developer which is Costco has purchased property and is proceeding and moving forward so we have used some of your hard-earned tax dollars 2.2 .2 million dollars to be exact on a loop on ramp there to get construction jobs going to ultimately in time develop an area that has the potential for 3 million square feet that is a lot more jobs, and we certainly don't need it today. It's, it will be needed in the next phase when the growth comes in 10 or 20 years from now. And so that's why we did the work today. That's why we use that money on shovel-ready projects, which is what the U.S. government asked us to do. And I almost turned the money down, to be honest, because you know that money wasn't free. That was tax dollars. It was hard-earned tax dollars. And it's hard to go blow it on something unnecessarily, but this wasn't unnecessary. If we were going to develop there, we must put money on the ground. We chose to do that correctly, very different than what's happening at Hawkins. There they've simply put their hands up and said, we don't have a viable money stream, so it's not our responsibility. That is inappropriate, and Caltrans cannot let that lie, and litigation is moving forward. Caltrans has tried hard to work with Hawkins, give them a reprieve to meet the traffic needs that are going to occur. They have so far failed. It could be resolved in time. We'll see. We'll, have, we'll be following it very closely. I believe that was your question to Patrick. It sounded like it was. Okay, and we agree up here that it was. Oh, you do? All right. Shoot. But you, you can uh, rebut. Okay, well, thanks, I'll rebut. Sorry, I didn't know that was a question. I was trying to respond to his. Um, this is kind of, a, I mean, you're, you're doing a very good job keeping it organized and I appreciate that very much. So my rebuttal would be, I think under the Hawkins development, um, I think they were trying to do all of that with no government funds. So now whether or not, I'm still not saying that's a good project or a bad project, what I'm saying is, you know, there's been a lot of tax dollars invested into Oasis, and it's been a pretty um, important project for you. And it was interesting how you referred to you deciding whether you would accept that tax dollars or not. I think there's a whole city council involved there. Before we continue, we'll go over the float time. Uh, Mr. Rhinus, you have 1 minute 15 seconds. Patrick, you have 1 minute 15 seconds. Pam, you have 5 minutes. Yeah, just to clarify, so not, we're not confused. I'm sorry if you were confused. Um, when someone brings up an issue, we're commenting on it, and we try to keep our questions to that single question. So, Okay, so we'll continue with Fred. How many more questions do we have? Three. This is number five. Well, okay. Patrick, uh, one of your uh, campaign uh, contributors, is, as I understand it from being here last week and listened to uh, Modi, uh, mentioned or asked Swindeman about uh, a large contribution of five grand. Your name came up that uh, you got 10 grand, and I heard today that you can now have 15 grand from the same fella. And uh, uh, I guess my question is, is that true? No, that's not true. I'm hoping it's 20,000. <laughs> no, I, I have received uh, from Mr. Rivers and Selmo a check for $10,000, and, uh, and I'm going to be bugging him for more. You know, in these campaigns, uh, and this is my fifth one, if you can't ask for money, you simply can't run an effective campaign and get your message out to the people, and you can't be heard. This is a 73-mile-long district, and I'm asking everyone here tonight, if you've got a little money, I could certainly use it. It is tough. 
the years that I lost, and I came in dead last two times because I had a hard time asking people for money, because it's not very nice asking hard-working people to give up good, hard-earned money. I work hard. I work six days a week, 10, 12-hour days, and I don't like blowing my money, and I'm sure most of you don't either. Um, so it's tough asking people for money, because I know how hard you work for it. Um, with with Reverge, it's a little different because he has lots of money. He came to me. He called me up and asked me. And he asked me, how much do you want? And I said, well, I don't know. As much as I can get. How about 5000 He said, how about ten? I said, I like your thinking. <laughs> me and RC, we've been friends for a while now. And, uh, and I think his case, what's happening with him, is going to be a battle cry for this election to a certain degree. The overreaching presence of the county government, instead of helping someone, instead of, instead of rolling out the red carpet is a term that I use, uh, we're trying to put someone down that literally wants to spend millions of dollars in our county. It's unthinkable, really. It's really unthinkable. But that's what they've done in the county. And, you know, and the city's not that far off of that. And I fought hard to try to fix those problems. But sometimes personalities get in the way of what makes good sense for the county. And uh, I'm on RC's side, uh, and I certainly am proud to receive $10,000 from RC. And I'm going to be hitting him up. He's, he's getting a little tighter now. That check was, uh, that hurt a little bit. Keep in mind, wealthy folks, they, uh, they've worked hard for their money in the past, too, and they don't like just giving it away as well. They want to make sure that, it's, that, that they'll pay their fees and they'll pay their amount, but they don't want to be taken advantage of. Now, R.C. likes me. He likes what I've done at City Hall. He's seen the fighter, the scrappiness that I have, the determination and that Patrick, I have. you've just used up all your float time. And, and that's, uh, that's is all I have to say about that. <laughs> you know, I didn't know anything about him until last... No, you know, R.C. I'm going to call him R.C., but uh, I don't know anything about him, but I did get on the net and take a take a peek at what's been going on so I, I'm a quick study and I got a chance to see what's going on and I, I empathize with his uh, with his plight uh, however uh, as loggers we have those conditions that he goes through every day uh, we fight those water folks all the time and they're down there in their spoons and their forks and doing all that kind of stuff all the time but we have to comply we have to comply uh, and uh, and I, I don't know. I, I really fell for him. In fact, I would like to map it out for you guys. And you, know, you guys could hit the road. And uh, you could present my case, basically. Uh, and you could really, really spout it out there because it really needs to be driven home that we are overregulated. And we got some folks that go to college, and, they, and it's nothing, you know, they, and we got them throughout all these different agencies, and they have PhD, PhDs, that's piled higher and drier, tr training them. And, uh, and uh, they come out, and they do. They look at all this micro stuff, and then they miss the obvious, the porcupine. Where'd he go? Uh, you know? Uh, but uh, but it, that's the way it is. And we do need to make a stop to it. And I, I'm all for your compassion and RC's compassion. And I think you guys ought to hit the road with his cameras and give me liberty, give me death, and, I'll, and go after it. Uh, it, ought to, it ought to happen. And, but, and that's where you really ought to concentrate. Uh, but I'm really concerned about what he's doing here with the county because he's, when, he's, when he's buying these supervisorial races and uh, your signs went from this big to this big. And uh, short order, and they're all over. You know, I don't have any. <laughs> Maybe he can kick me a little. Anyway, that's my my uh, concern. Uh, this question is to Pam. Pam, uh, on the Reading City Council, I've agreed to two terms, and I've refused all retirement and health care benefits, saving the the taxpayers and the ratepayers of the city of Reading about twenty thousand dollars a year. I will also do the same thing on the County Board of Supervisors. Will you join me and do the same? Uh, Patrick, I will uh, assure everybody that I will not do serve more than two terms. Um, I'm 53 years old. Uh, we figure uh, eight-year commitment is a pretty darn good commitment to serve our county, and uh, then I will move on. As to the retirement benefits, I honestly can't answer that question yet. Um, my husband and I have, or we have, I am a co-owner in three businesses, so we've got our HP Livestock, 
cattle ranching operation. We have our Hat Creek Roan premium natural grass finished beef, and then my sister and I also own the Century 21 in town. So I'm working hard in three businesses to make ends meet. I also have part time jobs managing our Northeastern California Water Association, as well as working in the Irwent program for the Upper Pitt River watershed. So I'm going to have to give up two of those part-time positions. So we need to sit back and probably cut back a, a significant amount of time in the Century 21 office. Um, thankfully, I've got nieces and nephews coming up to take over part of that. But that's going to change our financial picture considerably. And so um, we are going to have to sit down and look at that and see what that means for our long-term future. Because, you know, an eight-year commitment, four year four years for sure, and then hopefully folks, you know, I've done a good job and folks will re-elect me if that, if that occurs. But that's a commitment. I mean, it is a full-time job, and it's a serious business. So you're taking away from what you can personally earn as well to be able to look at your future. So I am, I'm not ready to make that commitment, Patrick. Do I have any float time left? Uh, zero. Is I, um, I want to make a comment for everybody in case it wasn't clear in the email. You can do whatever you want with your float time. Um, but if you have any remaining, you can use it as a closing statement. Now, as you can see through this format, you can... Uh, have shorter answers or shorter rebuttals, and you can gain back your float time. But no, Patrick, at this time, you've, you're at zero. Sorry. Um, this is for Patrick. Uh, many of our fights are, and uh, challenges at the county level are due to legislation or regulation that's passed at the state level. Can you describe for me um, experience that you've had at the state level? No, nope, I work at the city level, and the, really the, white, or the right way to attack these problems is you start at your local level, your bottom, and then you work your way up. And that's why I'm running for supervisor. I've worked for, you know, coming up to six years, and I've gone to years of council meetings before that, and then go up to your county level. I don't think you start in lobbying as in Sacramento first and then go back down to your local area second. I think you start on the very lowest level, Get your feet wet. Learn and understand what you have to deal with. And the fight, again, is here in Redding. It's not in Hat Creek. The issues are very vast and wide, and they must be dealt with. But the battle is down here, and you must learn the politics here in Redding. And I am the only one here that have spent a ton of time doing that, learning who to battle with, where to draw the coalitions when you need them to get things done for our residents. Eastern Shasta County is very important. The whole entire county is very important. But you need a fighter. You need a person that knows how to get the job done. Not a learning experience, but can hit the ground running. And I think I can do that. Uh, well, thank you, Patrick. I think Fred and I would both take issue that Eastern Shasta County isn't as important as Reading. Um, I agree that uh, the board is going to be pretty Reading-centric if we just uh, don't elect somebody like Fred or myself from Eastern Shasta County that really has a connection with those very rural issues. Um, my experience is over 20 years of experience working in the legislature as a lobbyist, as well as then the six years on the board of State Board of Forestry and Fire Protection wor working in the regulatory arena. Now what this has done is I've been able to bring together broad interests in order to effectively fight for our rural areas for our District 3 citizens, I have been able to fight for them in the state capitol, in the regulatory arena, to ensure that we protect their interests. I can easily bring that experience to the Shasta County Board of Supervisors and be very effective in finding solutions. Uh, Patrick. Yeah, do you think the high-density housing project proposed for the Fall River Valley was a good idea? Well, absolutely not. You know, that's a good, a very good question, and it was simply uh, a, a bad idea from the very beginning. There was no place for that up in the Fall River Valley. And it, all you would really have to do is ask the residents if this is something that they would want. And I think the answer would have been very clear that this is something that they did not want, that it was, that was inappropriate for the county to push that forward. And I certainly wouldn't have supported that as your supervisor. No rebuttal. 
Uh, this question is for Pam. Uh, on RABA, the 19% fare box ratio, do you agree with that? And, and, and again, this is the Reading Area Bus Authority where we spend around $6 million a year. Uh, I'm a board member there. It covers Anderson, Shasta Lake, Reading, and a route to Bernie. And so what can you tell us about the efficiency of that fare box ratio and do you support it? Well, Patrick, you got me on one. I'm sorry, I cannot answer that. But I will certainly do my homework and look into it. Thank you. Do I have any rebut? What, how much time? You gave a short answer and passed on a rebuttal, so you were back up to a minute and a half. All right. So Reading Area Bus Authority, um, this is just one of many boards and committees and commissions that I sit on. This is where we spend your tax dollars on a public transit system. I've been fighting very hard to scale that program way down. 19%, that's a goal that we set that we do not reach. When we spend a dollar, our goal was to get 19 cents back. That's pretty pathetic. If any business was doing that, you'd be out within two seconds. Uh, I've tried to raise that standard up by only having board members want to reduce the fare box ratio to a smaller amount. And keep in mind the 19% takes no consideration of capital expenditures. So when you really look at the total cost to run the Reading Area Bus Authority, when we spend a dollar, we get back about six cents on the dollar. We're subsidizing public transit. Your hard-earned tax dollars are going out for that service, and I think it's unacceptable. I think we need to be shooting for a much higher, much higher number and not settle on a measly 19%. And it's a battle that I take on. I was, I was at that battle just before I got here, and once again, they wanted to lower the fare box ratio. Uh, this is for Patrick. Um, Shasta County has the opportunity to receive a grant in order to expand the jail to try to absorb and handle the prisoners released under AB 109. This is a two-part question. First, do you think we ought to accept the grant? And the second part is, would you support the city contributing funds to run the jail since most of the detainees are residents of Reading? Well, I think we answered this a little bit earlier in that that I am very, very nervous about accepting grant money if we can't maintain it over the long haul. And the county has their areas that they're responsible for, and the city does as well. And they're very clear as to what those responsibilities are. And we both struggle to meet our obligations and the promises that we've made to our citizens. And so I, doubt, I don't think you'll see too much response from the city wanting to help a county issue for corrections and, and controlling our criminals. It is up to the county. We don't have to pass our responsibility off to someone else. We have to meet it head on and deal with it and make the tough decisions. I would be willing to accept that grant money and get that money and put it on the ground here in Shasta County and put people to work if we have a way that we can support that jail, that new facility, long term. And, and that's important. It, it, it's kind of like what we're seeing today with the veterans home, where we have a completed veterans home, but no funds to run it. And, and that is a real problem. Well, we ought to accept the grant as long as we can afford to run the jail, and that's the issue. We really need that floor opened in order to take in serious detainees which are threatening our citizens. And we've already seen a few instances that this is a huge problem for our citizens and we need to keep our citizens safe. So I would really urge the city to look at uh, participating with the county in order to help run the jail so that we can keep our citizens in the county and the city safe. I'm going to give you an update on your float time. Um, Fred, you have 1 minute 15 seconds. Patrick, you have 1 minute 30 seconds. Pam, you have 5 minutes. This question is for Pam. Pam, uh, do you have a preference? Uh, there was two projects in Bernie, one for a library and one for the rails to trails project that wanted some of the uh, windmill money. Do you have a preference for those two projects? Thanks, Fred. Um, you know, I, I know that Joe Studenecke has worked very hard on the Rails to Trail project, um, but I think the library project is highly important. Um, if 
I know you've probably been to our library, but if some of you have not been to the Bernie Library, man, I tell you, it is very tight. In fact, we tried to donate them a computer and a printer, and the, the space is so tight they couldn't accept it, which is very sad. Um, and so, yeah, I think the library project is very, very important. And I've actually discussed with Pat Minturn, um, they put together an initial estimate of over $500 a square foot to build a simple library in Bernie. That's way out of line. And so um, that's what the $40,000 is going for, is to look at the feasibility study and to actually get some good engineering estimates on the ground. And that's highly important. Um, there is no way that a simple one-story building housing a library in Bernie and potentially some other county offices should be over $500 a square foot. And so if we get a good feasibility study and are able to actually open a library for our local community, it would be very, very wonderful. Yeah, I, I think we need a library too. I think we need both projects. And I think, I think we ought to get all the money. It's our windmills. Uh, but uh, that's, that Rails to Trails project is a... Uh, it's been a six-year project by Joe Studenick and Bernie, and uh, the trails runs all the way from Bernie to uh, McLeod. It's going to be a walking, running, cycling uh, trail. It's going to really, really be a. It's going to be a lot like the Biz Johnson Trail if you're familiar with that over in Susanville. So, and then he's, then there's a proposed uh, uh, deal with the fire department there to have a training center and. Uh, and it's, that would really be a boon for our recreation for Bernie, and, uh, and I'd really like to see both those projects to go. Uh, this question is for Pam, and it concerns coordination on all government agencies in the city of Reading. Uh, the Reading City Council voted to coordinate with all local government agencies and hold them at bay. And I was wondering, uh, Pam, would you support coordination or just cooperation, like what we're seeing from the county? Uh, Patrick, uh, coordination is an interesting concept that was developed by Fred Kelly Grant many years ago, and he started in Idaho invoking this, as well as he also worked with Modoc County many, many years ago um, in order to invoke coordination. It is an important process. Um, my, my concern with it is that we ensure that we have staff time available in order to invoke it appropriately. That's the challenge. So if we sit down with the U.S. Forest Service, or we sit down with Bureau, Bureau of Land Management, and we ensure that we have reasonable debates and look at the issues that we need to handle and that we make sure that we are fairly represented and that we're in that discussion, might that be just as effective as invoking coordination? I mean, we need to look at that carefully and see um, what that staff time is going to cost us. Uh, maybe it can be a member of the Board of Supervisors that serves us at that. That would be part of that full-time job thing going on there. But um, we need to look at that carefully and see how we could invoke it appropriately. Well, that's what I figured you would say. That is an example of cooperation, not coordination. These government agencies, these bureaucrats are out of control. They're telling us what we can do and how we can do it, what roads are going to be open, what roads are going to be shut, what level of service is provided, and we've had enough. And we have this tool, and, and Pam is correct, Fred, Fred Kelly Grant did create this program. He's up there in Siskiyou County right now helping to try to keep those dams in place. And this process really does work. But you've, you, you create your plan. For example, when we did this in the city of Reading, it was specifically on all government agencies, but it was specifically with the national forests because they're shutting our roads down, and that has an, an adverse economic effect on Shasta County. And we said, your plan has to match our plan, and our plan says the roads stay open. Not this one or that one or some of these, but they all stay open. These bureaucrats, you can't be easy with them because if you are, they know how to gobble you up and spit you out. It's what they do. They're professionals and they've been lifelong bureaucrats. They're very good at it. We have to stand up. Time is now that we must stand up and support and fight what is ours. The National Force is ours as much as anyone else. As taxpayers, we need to fight for what's right and what's ours. Coordination is, if you truly look at it, it is the right way to go. So this is my question, not a rebuttal, right? I can't rebut the rebut. Okay. But I can comment. Can, can but I? you can comment on it. Oh, but Fred can comment. But I can comment, right? Right. How much, how much float Fred. time do I have? Oh. 
<laughs> Sorry, I, I couldn't pass that up. Excuse me. Uh, you have uh, a minute 30 seconds. Patrick, you've got a minute 15. And Pam, you're at 4.45, and you could comment using your flow time. Okay, so I, I can comment. Yes. Okay. Okay, so I'm commenting. I'm not asking my question. Okay, thank you. Just want to make that clear. Okay, so Patrick, uh, just so you know, I'm a, a, a permittee on U.S. Forest Service grazing lands. Uh, we run on 50,000 acres in the Hat Creek and, and Eagle Lake districts on the Lassen National Forest. And I tell you what, we are one of the permittees that cooperates. And we have worked hard, and we have an excellent relationship with U.S. Forest Service. And I tell you what, it has gotten us a lot farther than some permittees that just say no and won't work with the agency. Many, many years ago, probably almost 20 years ago now, um, I'm looking at my husband to give me a nod of whether I'm right on timing, but we were having some challenges with the U.S. Forest Service. And I tell you what, we decided we were going to take the ball into our own hands, and we figured out where we needed to set up uh, transacts in order to monitoring so that we could know what we were doing with our cattle out there on the range, and we would know what the conditions were, and we would show that to the U.S. Forest Service. Okay? Once we had that information in our hands, we got the upper hand, and we were able to work with the Forest Service to make sure that we have very good permitted ground and good long-term leases. That's what I mean by cooperation. Yeah, I think it's good to cooperate, but at, uh, this time I'm going to side with Patrick. Uh, I, uh, I've worked a lot with the Forest Service, and I'm not stabbing them in the back, but uh, bottom line is I, was, uh, I mapped the OHV trails for the Shasta Trinity, the Mendocino, and the Lassen in 2004, 2005, and uh, we've got a lot of road closures all over the place. And in the Trinities, we've got a tremendous problem, and you're going you're gonna to see it here real soon, in, in this summer. And uh, you talk about some carbon going in the air. Uh, we're going to have a bunch uh, because it's a mess over there. And I, I started out in my early career working over on the Yola Bolas, uh in the national in the national forest there. And it used to be pristine over there. You could drive in the forest, and we'd have signs directing you around, and you could had campgrounds open and everything. Now it's it's all decadent. Everything's falling apart. It's all coming down. Snags everywhere. They closed the campground there in White Rock, where I used to be stationed in a guard at a guard station, because there were big snags in the in the in the campground. There's no there's nobody using the forest out there, and it's all going to burn up. We're going to lose it all. Uh, the spotted owls are really going to do us a favor. Uh, uh, it's, it's, it's ridiculous. And the road closures, during the Clinton administration, they closed all them roads. I had keys to open every one of them, all those gates, and I went down them. You got grass growing this high in them that goes right over the top of your quad, and it's, it's just a tinderbox waiting to happen. Uh, and we're going we're gonna to lose them. We're going to lose them, and especially over in the Trinities. It's that way over where okay, we're Fred, at. Too. Fred, we need to thin time. those forests out. Now it's my question, right? Your final question. Great. Oh, final question. Okay. Um, so, Patrick, um, as I'm sure you know, the Williams Snack designation is to ensure that prime agricultural lands uh, stay in production agriculture. Uh, for that commitment, landowners get a decrease in their property tax. Um, how do you do? How do you view development on Williams Snack lands? Yeah, I wouldn't support that. And uh, you know, there was some talk about that particular issue. Uh, with regards to Anselmo Vineyard, and, and it was an incorrect assumption that the entire property that Mr. Anselmo had was or fell under, to the, under the Williamson Act. And so I can certainly support the Williamson Act and support Agland without question, um, but then we can also have lands that are set aside outside of the Williamson Act that we can develop. I think we have room to do it all. I think we can work with our landowners and make things happen. Uh, development on William Snack lands is completely inconsistent with the Act, and um, any development further threatens the subvention funds that come from the state, as well as the very integrity of the Act. Um, if we undo the Williamson Act, hundreds of landowners are going to be at risk for not being able to stay in agricultural production, which threatens the very open space that the public that lives in Reading and enjoys our open agricultural spaces to view or to recreate on is at risk. So we cannot allow any development on Williamson Act lands. 
Okay, we'll see if we have any float time left. So these will be your closing statements. Fred, Fred, you're going to have to sit this one out. <laughs> but, but, but I really liked your closing statement that you made before. See, no. me in, see me in my room. All right, there you go. And Patrick, you've got a minute and 45 seconds. And Pam, you've got three minutes, 15 seconds. So Patrick, closing statement. Well, first, thank you for having me. I appreciate the opportunity, as always. And uh, I think you'll see some differences here with us tonight. I think you can clearly see uh, different ways of governing. And sometimes it's not what we personally do or feel. It's how we behave, and it's our voting, right, our voting record that's important to the residents, that we represent you. We're all individuals, and we all do certain things, but the reality is that we represent the people. That's what an elected official does. They have to put aside their own wants and desires and represent the people. Obviously, in a district that's very large, you have a lot of different issues that are going to come up. And, and I think I'm up for that challenge. I think if you look upon Enterprise to Bella Vista to Palisadro to Montgomery Creek and Fall River and, and Johnson Park and Big Ben and Whitmore, you'll see that people have felt like they have not been represented very well in the last four years. They feel that they have simply been unheard. And I am committed to making sure that the will of the people gets done. I will stand with the people and fight the bureaucrats. And I know how to do that, and I know how to be effective here in the city of Reading. I grew up in Enterprise. I've been in Enterprise my whole life, with the exception of a couple years at Sac State University. So Shasta County is very important to me. I've spent my entire life here, and I am committed to working with the people to protect what is ours, to fight for what is ours. I have that reputation, and come June 5th, I very much appreciate your vote. I'm Patrick Henry Jones. I've got flyers at the back. Please feel free to take any yard signs. And as always, don't forget your checkbook. Well, thank you for this evening. Um, I really appreciate the opportunity to speak with all of you and for you to hear our discussions and our differences. And I agree, there are differences between us. I'm a very solution-oriented person. Um, I totally do my homework and I get in there and I listen to you and uh, basically put the whole package together to make the best decision and find the solutions for Shasta County. Um, I've been here for four generations, fortunate enough to um, be, have my great grandfather, you know, land in Hat Creek, which is beautiful, and we've worked hard over these four generations to keep that together. My husband and I have developed a couple of other businesses that have been very effective, and we know how to meet a payroll. We know how to stay in business, and that takes very creative thinking sometimes and very aggressive. I would do the same thing serving you on the Shasta County Board of Supervisors. I would look forward to your vote. Um, please go to my website, pamjacomini.com. And if you can't spell Jacomini, that's okay. You can go pamgdistrict3.com. That'll work too. And I would love you to stop by our, my room and have a visit. Thank you. Okay, let's give him a nice round of applause. Thank you for coming tonight. It was very informative.